Did you introduce him? Get a little more space here so that, uh, well, let's see, we have to adjust the camera. I'm a little taller. Okay, we're ready to go, ladies and gentlemen. I brought one of my friends to show, so I'm going to pack it in here for the uh, Zoom crowd. This is one of my coffee trees, uh, a uh, yellow catuai, which I really like. The Very healthy tree. Oh, they've come on nice now that it's warming up. Uh, they, they, they're they acid-based, so uh, coffee trees, avocados, and citrus can take a little bit of a beating in the cold weather in terms of they'll, they'll lighten up, they'll turn yellowish uh, oftentimes. Um, so my name is Scott Murray. I've been an organic farmer for 51 years. Um, started while I was at University of California, Santa Cruz, and uh, was able to pay off all my student debt the, the year after I completed um, with my gardens that I had set up around Santa Cruz. Um, and uh, our business is called Murray Farms, Inc. Uh, my wife is an organic inspector and works all over the country. She's now one of the most senior ones. And then I do consulting and we also do growing. And now our primary grower is our daughter. So that's really exciting. Um, one of the things I have here to show you tonight um, are, are in this very first slide. The top slide is a painting done by an artist that shows San Diego at 240 feet of sea level rise. And uh, the bottom slide there in the middle is a, a biodiversity chart that shows all of the potential growing zones between San Diego and Ensenada that have sufficient groundwater to grow food. And most of it's developed over, unfortunately. Um, on the left side is a, a picture of a research project that I've been doing with uh, uh, Whittier College. Uh, it started as a, a real fly in the ointment in administration, but now they've named it the Whittier College Coffee Initiative because it's very successful. Um, and the other thing that is the key to being a farmer in San Diego County these days is that's a well drilling rig. And uh, I doused a spot uh, roughly. And then when we cleared it a little bit with a tractor, I went back in and redoused it uh, 12 passes over that center and put down four flags in the in the, the real hot spot. They ended up being in a four by four inch square. And the crew right there is maneuvering that 80 ton machine to get the drill bit right between the four flags, mm -hmm. the, the center of the drill bit. That well hit uh, at 870 feet, 200 gallons per minute. And uh, what we do the, in, in drilling a well, well, we do a six inch pilot hole that if you find water, then you have to do the development. And generally we bore out the well to at least eight inches. So a six inch pump can be submerged. Um, we also hit several, for the first 400 feet, we hit very rough material, which they call fracture zones. So we cased that down to, to 400 feet, drilled it out to 12 inches, cased it with eight inch casing or 10 inch casing, and then dropped the drill down and started back to our uh, 870 feet. I got out there the day that they, they were finishing at noon and they said, well, we've hit 870 feet. Should we pull the drill out of the hole? I said, well, I paid for you for all day. I want another 100 feet. So we went down to 1,000 feet, hit another 50 gallons a minute. So that hole is now producing 250 gallons a minute. And it's on a 29-acre avocado grove that I'm interplanting the whole thing with coffee. The first phase is about 700 coffee trees. Um, so now if I can figure out, ooh, did it work? No. In um, Valley Center, right close to Highway 15. Oh, I figured out how to make it change. Thank goodness. This is my wife and daughter. She's our, our primary farmer now on our small farm. It's only 1.13 acres. Um, but we used to farm hundreds of acres. Um, and as my the years caught up with me, my knees started to say, hey, you know, all this time on your knees is not a good thing. So I've transitioned to more teaching and uh, being a consultant uh, to my clients. Um, but there's a question I always like to ask. We've all heard that you are what you eat, right? 
And now there's a popular concept that if we go to lab grown meats, it's much more environmentally sound and energy efficient. But my question is, what do they feed the cells, right? What is it that we're eating when we eat lab grown meat? And those are proprietary information from the, the major companies involved in it. But a number of states have already decided that they want to make it illegal to sell lab grown meat in the states. Um, let's see. Come on. Uh, oh, it changed. Okay. So I want to ask forgiveness. I, I am a Mac person. So I, I built this uh, presentation in Keynote. And when you convert it to a PowerPoint, it throws off a few things like the, the wording. But one of the keys, no matter what it is we're growing, is soil building. Because we're not only farming plants, we are farming soil. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, oh, actually, we skipped over one of the slides. Let's see if we can get back. So this slide shows one of the key things on the left is just good compost. We really only have one place left in San Diego County that's making dairy compost. That's the San Pasquale Valley Soils Yard that's part of Conine Dairy right by the Wild Animal Park. And uh, e Ebenheiser up in uh, Ramona is connected to a family chicken business. So he makes an excellent chicken compost. So we have two resources for, for organic growing in the county. Um, do, do they not still have the uh, compost company there, Slaughterhouse Canyon Road off 67? Well, but they, the problem for them is they sell other people's compost. Okay. We have a lot of people that do that, but we only have two producers okay. left. We used to have 150 dairies in San Diego County in right. the early uh, 1900s. Um, now, but now, yeah. two, well, less three. three. And two of them are, are so small, they really don't count as a dairy anymore. The picture at the bottom in the center is one of my favorite things. The um, nitrogen fixing nodules on a legume. And if the, the soil is just moist enough and you pull gently enough, you don't rip them off. And you can see that the, there's a lot of white on that clover. Um, and that's one of the things that tells us we've built a good soil medium to work in. Um, up on top is just an example of, of another thing that we have to do is be very, very concerned about water. Where's our water coming from? And uh, so we built our our new orchards on um, contour swales and those swales once we're finished it have a, a berm along the upper edge and the whole walkway can store water in a heavy rain and then it takes a couple of three four days to penetrate and it's going right down the root zone of our trees saves up to 50 percent of your water which is really nice and then this is just a healthy avocado as part of the research project at Whittier College. So this is weird, move over. Okay, so I, I, this picture soil building um, cover crop on the left-hand side at about uh, 12 to 16 inches. That cover crop got to over three feet. At three feet, it produces about 300 pounds of nitrogen per acre yeah. if we incorporate the material. Um, this was- alfalfa growing? Um, it is actually a five legume mixture okay. with a, an oat as the, the, the first emergence oh, to break up the soil. Um, the bell beans in there will get about four feet tall. There's vetch, clover, um, and, uh, field peas. Um, the center picture shows, um, just as we we're preparing a section, you know, using a disc, uh, or a rototiller when you're preparing a large area helps you get it all organized. We don't do that very often. We tend to build permanent beds, but at some point, um, the concept of no-till agriculture requires some tillage to get there. <laughs> um, and then the my daughter and wife are, are planting bare root fruit trees for our demonstration that we're doing there on the right. And then one of the things I always look for when I walk farms is mycology. What, what's happening? Are there mushrooms growing? Because that's a great indicator of a healthy soil system. Come on, baby. Uh, it's got this box covering the... Okay. Very slow. Okay. Cover cropping. 
Yeah. Yeah, that's the I, I have to be patient here. Good Lord. It makes it fun though. <laughs> it it's doing its thing. Okay. This is the slide we just finished. One press. Um, so one of the real key things is we always have to be thinking about what's going on under the soil surface. Um, and so all the trees that I plant, I use uh, mycorrhiza. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I believe in a, in a strong nutrient package to get a tree established as well. Um, this is my coffee greenhouse for the 29 acre um, avocado orchard we're interplanting with coffee. They're getting ready to go out this, this summer. Um, we have a, my God, when the coffee starts to flower, um, I have 98 trees of 34 varieties. And I was watching and watching, when's, when are they gonna flower? When, when's one gonna flower? I came out one morning and all of them were flowering at the same time. So, okay, that's where you wanna be. Is um, this Valley Center? Um, no, uh, Vista. Vista. On the far right is Valley Center. And then my daughter with one of our security cats that, that spends a lot of time on her back whenever she bends over. Uh, we had that once with me and it startled me so much. I threw myself up and the cat went about 20 feet and he knows not to get on my back. <laughs> um, over on the right hand side is the hope for the future in San Diego County agriculture. Um, we have a lot of land that was planted in the 1970s to avocados and some citrus. And those trees are all getting pretty old right now. Um, and the farmers are getting old. So my one of my colleagues bought this 48-acre uh, farm that was a turned-off avocado grove. And some of the trees were dead, but only about 40%. The other 60% we've managed to prune and bring back to productive life because they're amazing, resilient trees. And that's a lesson for coffee. Coffee is also here. We don't have the kind of dry season that most coffee growing regions have where they'll have two to four months of, I mean, really, really dry. And the coffee trees can almost defoliate and look dead. Um, but then when the rains start, boom, they'll come back to life really quickly and very nicely. So um, the Harris's, uh, one of the things that I advocate heavily for getting coffee established is what I call a protection structure. And these white cones that are visible are, are basically a chicken wire ring that's three to four feet high, depending upon the plant size. And then we wrap the outside with agricultural fabric, a couple of stakes to hold it. And we use those for six months to a year because the little coffee trees, as I said earlier, are a little bit like ballerinas. If you take this little baby tree and stick it right out from a greenhouse into the middle of an open field, the winds and everything buffet it incredibly. But if you give it a little protection in its first six months or more, um, and it will get much more established, fill up those cones, and then we um, harden the, them off by rolling the fabric up over about a four-week period slowly, patiently, and then we take the wire off and they're on their own and can do really well in the full sun here, but they really like to have protection. So this particular property, right on the right-hand side is the, the, the ridge, and the winds come ripping over that ridge. And when they were starting, I said, you know, don't put the coffee right up here at the top, go down a little bit. So there's three rows of avocados, then three rows of coffee, then three more rows of avocados. They're building down the hill in that way. Ah, uh, now I can see the, the button. So again, back to cover cropping, just to, to really make the point, it is the ultimate carbon drawdown tool as well. And what do we want to build our soil? We want carbon in our soil. We get humus that way. Um, in this particular area, I planted around a tomato crop that we hadn't quite taken out. We love to make ketchup every year. So we grow some tomatoes for that. And I put in a little test crop of wheat, you know, bought a pound of wheat seed and, and, and planted it in furrows. And in, you know, 90 days, it was three feet tall, set heads of wheat. Amazing, you know, enough to make about 10 loaves of bread. Um, so that was kind of fun. But the key 
is, is we have to manage all the risks on the farm. Uh, one of the risks on the farm is, is just preserving the landscape, but another risk is grass fire, you know, and fire risk, and, and then also conserving water. So every, every 1% that we build the soil organic matter, we quadruple the soil's water holding capacity, which is a really good thing. Um, okay, let's see, be patient. That I press a push. Oh. Um, on our particular place, I'm the grazer with, with a cutter, um, but I work with cattle. I work with sheep. I work with um, grass-fed pork um, and ch free-range chickens. All those are very good. Chickens are pretty destructive. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, they they like to they like to scratch the soil away. So you have to manage that part a little bit. But um, so on the the left we have um, the three-year-old coffee trees at Whittier College, uh, Professor Zappia and Professor Fissori, and. Uh, then in the middle, I have two pictures of the plant I was talking to some of you about. It's called Portulacara afra, or around California, it's a common landscape plant, and it has used to be called dwarf jade, but it's not actually a jade. It's more closely related to our purslane, um, and it's one of the plants, 3% of terrestrial plants have two forms of photosynthesis, and the 3%, the they can shut their stomata in the daytime, and store the, the light, the energy from the sun in a chemical precursor. But what's exciting is this particular plant, which where it's from South Africa, it's called elephant's lettuce there because it's edible and the elephants love it, 80% of their diet. But one acre of this plant can draw down 10 times the amount of carbon dioxide as an acre of tropical rainforest. I've been doing this for 51 years and for about 48 years, I always thought that was the gold standard. Um, and then this, this desert plant comes along and says, hey, check this out. <laughs> um, and this is another view. I wanted to show you the wheat that I grew in between the green cover crop, which is just about ready to be incorporated in the soil. And then we're harvesting the wheat. That doesn't have, it's not weedy. It doesn't, uh... We weeded it. No, but that's South Africa plant. It doesn't become an invasive weed. The the wheat? No, not the wheat. Oh, the portulacaria or the elephant's lettuce. Um, <clears throat> all plants reproduce. Some reproduce really aggressively. And those are the ones that we're most aware of as invasive. Um, this one is primarily an invasive by cuttings, right? So the elephants would eat it like clomp, clomp, clomp and drop a lot of pieces out. That revegetated the, the plantings very successfully. But then the South African government allowed um, goat herders into the, the, the areas where this go, grows, and the goats kill the whole plant. Yeah. They, yeah. they eat every little bit of it, and then they discovered that they were losing because where this grows, it's 20 degrees cooler in the, it, to, to live around these plantings of plant. It's, it's very amazing. But this plant is part of my research at, at Cal State Northridge and a grant with Cal Fire because it's fireproof. It will not burn. They, in South Africa, they were testing it. They had a quarter acre patch, you know, and they'd put kindling and paper in and that would all burn and the plant would still be there. So they got tired of that and they put gasoline over it. And oh, oh, the gasoline all burned off. And they had this bubbling mass of green goop on the ground. No fire. The gasoline burned off and the plants didn't burn. So we're, we're looking, what are the solutions? And with, with Cal Fire, you know, fire is a huge problem. Most, we have probably 50% of California homes will be without fire insurance this year because of fire danger mm -hmm. that we haven't been managing sufficiently historically. And insurance companies that have they're just refused like, to, the, to- They're walking away. The fire. So, and then we have um, critical infrastructure um, is really good to be planted with, with barriers of this plant. For example, power poles with transformers cost 50% of the fires that utilities because the, the transformers can fail. The other 50% is from broken power lines. So that's why they cut lightning. the trees and a little bit of lightning, but the lightning 
only is counted if it knocks down a power pole or a line. But so another part of this game is this co concept of permanent and culture, right? And you've heard the word permaculture, right? And if, if we think as if we're creating an ecosystem that will outlive us, that's a permaculture thought. And, um, you know, it's, it, it's a classic process. What are the human needs? What are the ecological and regenerative design? Gathering information is the first part. We go, we look, what's happening? I always look at what the indicator plants around an area are. As rare fruit growers, we are going, oh, you know, what am I, how am I going to grow this? And you do a little bit of studying and you find, oh, like they, they started growing coffee here because it grows near avocados in Central America and Hawaii very successfully. So like, let's try it. Oh, it won't work. It's impossible. Oh, then I'm going to do it. <laughs> but the other part is we need water. Again, the water. This is a facility that we did for one of my clients. We drilled a well right behind that facility. Uh, the curving roof is the solar panels that power the well. We have a packing shed underneath on the left side. On the right side, we have an RO system because we were concerned at the very beginning that the saltier water would be um, a, dissuade our coffee from growing successfully. On this site in 2015, I put in 2,300, um, 2,332 trees. And one I planted and I had a crew of 30. The one I planted was right on the corner of the field. And in year four, uh, that tree produced 16 pounds of cherries and it was about this tall. Mm -hmm. And green uh, ripe cherries equate to about 55% um, the weight of cherry and pulp and about 45% the weight of seed and parchment. So we, when we separate those, uh, the honey process, we keep them together and dry them down and then crack the parchment at, right before roasting. Um, but the cherry is an amazing superfood in, in of itself and has an incredible amount of caffeine in it comparably. I've had like, oh, I got to go to a meeting and I'm wagging, so I need a cup of coffee, but I don't have time to make the coffee. I go in my greenhouse and grab 10 only ripe cherries. And while I'm driving, I'm eating them and I'm, I'm fine. Now I know 10 because the first time I tried it, I had 30. <laughs> and at three in the morning, I was still talking like this. You can't believe what a day we had. You know, I was like, oh, okay, back off. <laughs> um, but this system is, is I'm really proud of because we even harvest the rainwater on the very left bottom side to put it into a biodiversity garden to create right. insect habitat for the farm. Um, okay. Patience. Who designed that building? A friend of mine who's an architect that works with me. Um, as an agricultural advisor, we do a lot of buildings mm -hmm. as well. So I work with several different architects um, to uh, create innovative buildings that... that because that's, that's a very specific... Oh, yeah. Uh, ...process-oriented building. Yes. And and there was nothing there, so now we have we also have an office on it, um, and uh, it can run the whole well system plus provide additional power. So, um, food and plant systems to provide for our needs: designing a natural system, creating an integrated system where plants and animals support each other. We talked about the grazing animals. One of our best solutions to managing our our back country is grazing. Um, when we don't graze an area, then we have ferocious potential for fires and cattle keep it down. And then they're, they're they informally spread fertilizer around as well. And uh, wildlife is also a key animals. Uh, but like we love our farm because it's become such an amazing habitat and we have such an array of birds. Uh, every year we have golden orioles that return from Costa Rica and it's like, oh, they're back. Um, and welcoming natural diversity and observing how it works together for our good is a piece of my practice. Um, so permaculture is a design first system, um, starting with a problem, finding a solution by building resilience and supporting people to live within our ecological means. What a concept. So this is a, a test section of um, 
36 avocado trees at six foot spacing. So my high density spacing is six feet apart for all my trees except for pecans. And I've given my pecans seven and a half feet. And my daughter says, dad, in 20 years, these trees are going to be a dense jungle. And I said, it's not going to be my problem. <laughs> <laughs> in the meantime, I get to enjoy the, the nuts. One tree last year gave two nuts its second year in the ground. Um, and there, I have four low chill varieties. Low chill is a big part of my work because um, a lot of people have planted, you know, the classic apricot in uh, uh, right on the coast that they bought at Home Depot, but it needs 800 hours of cold chill. And they have a big, beautiful tree. Why doesn't it ever fruit? And I go and I, you know, can I find a tag? Oh, well, huh. you kind of bought the wrong tree. But here you can see how we're building our, our um, tree bed swales. Um, there's a, a walkway on either side, and then we, we move that soil that we had um, loosened with the rototiller to make those beds that have basically about a 10 to 12 inch uphill side and a little bit more on the downhill side. So we raise the, the trees up from the ground level, which helps with their drainage and their root health, um, but especially it harvests a tremendous amount of rainwater. And that cuts your costs tremendously. What, what uh, varieties are hardy pecans part of the varieties that you use? Um, the, the varieties that I use are, have been recognized as low chill varieties. Okay. And, and that's the key for us here close to the coast. We get up to about 400 hours of cold chill. I've always wanted to grow cherries as, as Steve Murray does. Um, and, but I never wanted to live in Julian. And now with low chill varieties, um, especially development. Mini Royale, Royal Lee. Well, Floyd Zager is, yeah. you know, the, the Luther Burbank of our modern time. Amazing gentleman. Just passed last year at 94. In his 94th year, he was doing 200 new crosses. Mm -hmm. And every cross that he did, he'd raise 10,000 seeds and select one tree. Did you say Floyd? Uh, Zager. Floyd Zager. Right, right. Yep. Yeah, Zager Genetics. Zager Genetics. Right. So on the left here, on the right side is the coffee planting at Whittier College with the protection structures right after we did it. And on the left side is what those trees look like at three years, which is pretty amazing. And um, in the center, one of the intercropping, because part of what I'm also doing in the six foot spacing is an intercrop in between. And I'm testing pineapples. Um, and that's pretty amazing to grow pineapples outside in Vista. And they're you know, incredibly sweet. Uh, the bottom photo is the primary pest of greenhouse coffee is uh, mealybugs, right? And that's a mealybug destroyer. That is the coolest insect that you can imagine. It's a little tiny, half the size of a regular ladybug, a black and gold, but the larva gets huge. And the outside body of the larva mimics the mealybugs waxy um, outside. And so the ants that farm the mealybugs come right up to it and they'll, they'll feel it and they'll go, oh, you're okay. And they'll pass by. But any, any other predator, if they detect it, they'll attack it and kill it. So we, every, every year we, we get this sort of spring flush of mealybugs and then we'll put out the, the, um, the beetles and their eggs. If they find uh, mealybugs, they lay their eggs in the mealybugs and then the mealybugs will eat like uh, just clean the greenhouse out. It's amazing. Um, I'm getting this. It's only taken 12 slides, but maybe. Um, I was trying to think of the, the name while I'm speaking, um, but they call it the mealybug destroyer. A and, um, you know, it's got a long scientific name that I need my entomologist buddy to help me with that one. Um, so this is a slope of our property um, in the bottom section of that is the, um, the avocado trees I showed in the previous picture just being planted and they're interplanted with artichokes. Uh, we now have some artichokes that are from seed rather than just propagating from roots. Um, 
And this particular one is called Wonderful, and it was aptly named. It's the best artichoke I've ever eaten. And artichokes will live five to seven years. So if you can grow them from seed, they'll have a fruit the first year, but then they'll keep producing. Um, so do you grow these up and uh, let them go to seed on a lot of them? No, we sell them. Okay. Because we don't have avocados to sell for the first couple of years. Um, those 42 plant, or 32 plants produce $42.50 worth of fruit last year each on average. A couple were more productive than others, but the average. So when you can, you know, get 42 bucks for an in, intercrop in each season, that helps a lot. Um, then on the slope, we have some coffee. At the very bottom of the slope where the avocados start is where the, the pineapples are. And then on the right side at the bottom, is the east side of my house where I have a, a slope. And that's the most wind sheltered part of the house. So the coffee trees do the very best there. Um, but I tried them in every zone on the property. And in the very windiest zone, they don't thrive. They get tra trashed a little bit too much by the wind. So we put up like a reed fence, then they're fine. But that's what you do when you're experimenting. We have to see, could this become, could coffee become a crop that we can make a living growing in San Diego County. And the cost of production in Hawaii averages $25 a pound. So that's the target that I'm working with. And it's a high labor crop to pick because you, you hand select every cherry based on color. And it's a little easier when you have mass flowering at the same time, but the plant also will flower progressively through the season. And then on the top right is just a, a beautiful little um, layout that was done showing the flower around to the seed, to the green bean after the parchment's taken off. The top left, it's kind of tan. That's where it has still the parchment on it, which is a thin cuticle layer protecting the seed. And then off onto roasted and into the, the bean juice that we love so much. Um, so be patient. <laughs> deliverance. So coffee can bring a high price. Um, this package in the center is a four ounce tube of, of roasted um, geisha variety, which is one of the, the top varieties in the world right now for the gourmet high end of the, the marketplace. This was grown on the planting I did in 2015. My client there is a rock star, literally. A gentleman by the name of Jason Mraz. And but that coffee sold for $796 a pound roasted. $796 a pound. So each of the four ounce little tubes was $199. And you could buy a cup for 35 bucks. Just because it was Pardon? Just because it was so unfamous? No, actually. It, for him, it, it helps sell it because he has a lot of people that, that are his fans. But there is an ultra premium coffee market in the world where $2,000 a pound is not unheard of. But it's like the top one half of 1% of the whole coffee world. An interesting thing about coffee is it's the number two trade in the world after oil is coffee. The volume of dollars exchanged and moved around the world is second only to oil, which is. Yes, geisha, originally from Yemen, went to Central America as an experimental plant. It was planted on, on the corner of a, of a big farm and uh, they just mixed it in with the other stuff. They never really paid attention. And then the, they sold that section of the farm to another grower who was inspecting the farm and he said, he asked the, the major domo there, what's with these trees? Oh, they, the Coffee Institute brought us those and said, please plant these like eight years ago. And he said, this year, we're going to separate these beans out from the others. And he did some research and found out it was a geisha variety that was sent from Yemen for breeding coffee. And that beans is what sells for 2000 bucks a pound at auction every year from that original planting is one of the very best. Um, there's a picture in the center. It didn't come out as well as I wanted, but that shows that little coffee tree is this big. 
And that protection structure, you can Are see- Are you talking about the one in the tube? Yeah, right in the low center. So that's an inside view. And yeah. those trees are now this tall, you know, four years later and just covered with beans. Um, this is another view of the, the, the east side of my house. And in the, there's a, a, I planted in that section, there's four avocado trees as, as high shade providers. So in, in the coffee growing regions of the world, you hear of shade grown, but it's not the kind of shade where we planted in Jason's place in between rows of avocados that were 50 years old and we stumped them. And now we keep them only to 20 feet by annual pruning. And we put some right up underneath, but not enough sun to ripen cherries. Where they get more sun, where they have the wind protection and the community, then they thrive. Um, and here on the right is, you know, you can see some nice green beans uh, spread on that um, branch. Um, the coffee is, is a pretty amazing, oh, did I skip one? No. Well, um, I wanted to bring my rarest fruit, and this is a lulu. Um, it's a tree tomato from Honduras um, last June, so not even a year. My buddy brought me two of them in, a, in gallon pots that were about this tall. And immediately I transplanted them to a five gallon pot. And two months later, they were ready to go out on the farm. And in the bottom photo, you can see the first fruits that we have developing. It has a very unusual flower structure, but very similar to tomatoes because it's a related plant. Hmm. And uh, also a very thorny leaf. It, 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 it's like armored on both sides with thorns, um, but also incredible architecture. The picture on the right just shows the underside veining of the leaves and that and they come out purple. You know, it's like, wow, what an enjoyable plant to have around. Um, this is where this tree came out of, um, the nursery in a shade house uh, on our farm. Um, and uh, we have 10 types in our coffee collection this year. I've got about 300 trees that, that we're selling. Um, and uh, the, the list of types is um, Katuai, Aikatu, Pakamara, uh, Katu, Katura Red, Villa Sarchi, uh, iCafe 90, which is one of the most successful hybrids uh, out of the Central American Coffee Institute because they're working on disease resistance. Um, the Central American growers and coffee growers around the world have a lot of disease issues. Um, we have also um, Obata, Yellow Katura, Limpura, another one of the hybrids from the Coffee Institute, uh, Paranema. Um, and one of the cool things about these different varieties is we can't grow a, a weak coffee to, and, and try to make money because uh, if we have $25 costs, we have to sell at least $50 a pound to, to make a business out of it. Um, the uh, the Paranema has, has cupped at 88. Um, the Yellow Katura has cupped at 87. Um, the Geisha has cupped as high as 94. Is on cupping? cupping is a, a scale that's a professional thing like Saumoyer, where they they taste for all these different things in the coffee and they evaluate it on a numerical scale. And coffee above 80 is what we call the premium. Um, the coffee below 50 is what we call industrial. <laughs> and in between is, is what most of us get to drink. Um, and Robusta has been a plant that has been very misunderstood. It's a much faster uh, tropical lowland coffee. Uh, it'll set it set and ripen beans in three months. Whereas here we have 12 months uh, of bean development. But that seems to be one of the, the keys for us is extra quality. Normal Arabica is only six months, but the extra six months that we have, some of the experts are saying, oh, you have more time on bean. That's very cool. <laughs> um, Let's see what comes up. Your next. seeds are maturing more. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and just like a reed avocado, um, Julie Frank says it should sit on the tree for a year. 
to get ripe where most people will want to hook them at six months. Yeah. Yeah. And, and sometimes you, you miss and they go over, you know, uh, there's a lot of in between, like my wife doesn't like really ripe avocados. I love them, you know, so she goes up, oh, this one's for you. Okay. <laughs> um, I like the picture on the left because it shows the coffee protection structures up at Whittier College after a rainstorm with the sunset. And I was talking to some of the folks earlier about one of the tendencies of acid loving plants like coffee, avocados, and citrus is if we don't load them with enough nitrogen by the end of October, before the cold weather starts, they'll scavenge um, nitrogen from their leaves and they'll, they'll have low amount of nitrogen because they can't translocate it as effectively. And that little tree had just come out of its cage and the leaf tips were all very yellow, um, but we fertilized it and two weeks later, you couldn't tell the difference. It, so that was lack of nitrogen on that leaf yellow. Yep, yep. And uh, then we have a, a planting crew. Um, the plants that we put in there at Whittier College were in three by three inch pots. Uh, the nursery work that was done on those, um, normally they use a tree pot that's like a 12 inch top, a style pot. And we thought, well, we'll see what happens. But they've all grown really well. They, they were not too bound in that tiny pot. Um, and it allowed us to, to do quite a bit more. So kind of like the future of coffee in California, can we make it a business that people can actually invest in and, and have success? Um, we need a group of growers to solve all the problems of the coffee cultivation. We're the early pioneers. That's what the rare fruit growers have always been in my life is the pioneers of, well, People give you something and you say, it won't grow here. I'm going to try. And you try to figure it out, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And, 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 and we, you know, it's like, well, that didn't work. Let's try this, you know, two or three tries, maybe one try. So um, testing of many different varieties is one of the things that I'm working on because we have to, you know, there's selections that, that are better in our climate than they are in other climates or vice versa. Um, so right now I have 34 types in my collection. Um, coffee is self-fertile, so the trees won't cross-pollinate unless you really do the effort. Um, they can be right next to each other and they breed true. Um, and I have 20 more types that I, I just brought in from uh, the Honduran Coffee Institute to, to add to the collection for trying in San Diego. And uh, I'm always asking, which one's going to be our superstar? You know, if we figure that out, that'll be a key part of the business, right? So one of the examples is all of our avocados started as seedlings. Just people were bringing seeds that were collected out of the rainforest. They ate the avocados and put the seeds in a bag and brought them to California. And then they started to plant them out. Um, and right on both sides of Whittier, um, Mr. Fuerte was in the south of Whittier up on the side of the hill Haas. and Haas was in La Habra Heights right next door to Whittier on the north side. And uh, both of them discovered pretty revolutionary trees that have maintained, right? But Haas is the least heat tolerant of our avocados. Um, I have clients in Ventura County and uh, three years ago, we had a heat event there in August where it was over 110 degrees for 12 days. And 80% of the Haas avocados in the county dropped to the ground. The trees weren't all killed. Some baby trees were killed. Um, I mean, one picture I had is my farmer was heavily mulched and intercropped and everything. And the next door farmer had just put the trees out there in the middle of nowhere all by themselves. His were just crisp, dried, dead, and hers thrived. Right. But the key is how do we find what the future of avocados is? Mm -hmm. So one of the things we did during that heat event at the end of it is we went around and observed all the other seedling varieties that pop up in groves. It, it, you know, we've all seen it. You, you're growing something and then you see a little thing sprouting next to it. And it's like, how did that get there? Yeah. Uh, oh, it's uh, in oh. in the grove in Whittier. We're already 
where we haven't beans that we didn't pick are, are sprouting in the, the shade of the trees and we're digging them up and transplanting. Have you looked into the Aravipa avocado? I have two of them that were sent to me from a colleague in Arizona. Okay. And this is an avocado tree that was found in Southeast Arizona in the Aravipa, Aravipa Valley. River Valley. And it's it gets 115 degrees in summer and it gets snow in the winter and its roots are down in the Aravipa River. Yeah. And it was discovered by some fruit explorers in an area where rail camps were for the Continental Railway. A year old tree. Yeah. And uh, the, so they then grafted that tree um, and they've tried it in a number of places in Arizona. Not one has survived. And the two they sent me, um, I was going to get one but somebody broke off one of the trees above the graft and it was just a stick in a pot, right? And they said, send that one to Scott, you know, like you. If anybody can save it, he can. And Is that Dan Jones you're working with over there? No. Okay. No, Greg Peterson. Okay. Um, but one of my favorites are the yellow fruited, the yellow cherry coffees and the orange cherry coffees. Red is the common one, but... This yellow one is just stunningly beautiful, you know. Um, and if we harvest the, if we process the beans in a in a kitchen, you know, a food safe kitchen, the pulp and skin are a valuable product. And uh, we've sold um, frozen sheets of it to smoothie bars, and they can throw a chunk of that into your smoothie, and you get a jag of caffeine and some more sweetness and and some uh, superfood. Um, Are the uh, yellow beans uh, sweeter than the red or a little not I've, quite as I've tried them side by side and I really don't notice a difference. It's just the color and I'm a sucker for the color. Pigmentation. The pigmentation. So do you have any questions or did I answer everything? <laughs> um, what, what avocado varieties are you growing primarily? Well, um, I had two parts to add to that. Right now I'm testing 24 varieties, five of which are seedlings that we've okay. collected and observed. Um, I have some different Haas because it's so popular as uh, in the industry, but I'm really interested in the what we call the constellation of fruit we used to grow. Uh, I was born in 53 and I, I went to a property that I helped revitalize and in a drawer in the kitchen, they had the 1953 crop report from San Diego County. And that report, Haas was 0.89% of the trees we had. And we had 20 other varieties and we sold avocados year round that were freshly picked, right? right? And now we're, we're constrained into the Haas window and imports to fill it in. Mm -hmm. And the, the growers that have not been paying close enough attention are, are up in arms now because they've discovered that the packing sheds, nine out of 10 of the packing companies invested in production in Mexico. Yeah. And what they're doing is they're selling their Mexican fruit before they're interested in buying fruit from local growers. Sad. When they tell you it, it becomes legal to sell the, the third week of December in normal years, and they told last year, they told growers, we'll be interested in buying from you at the end of May and June. And that means six months more hanging on the tree, being blown off in the wind, being attacked by rats and things. Higher oil content. But but it is a higher oil content. Now, I wanted to tell you about one more of the seedling. Well, we found in the heat event in Ventura, we found several varieties that were great fruit, but really heat tolerant. So we propagated those, but a colleague of mine in the resource conservation business, he brought me a, a fruit one time at a meeting. He pulled it out of a big grocery bag and it was this big. It weighed seven pounds and it was as big as an NFL football. And it was an excellent fruit. It was, it, it, it rivaled Reed and, and Haas as a quality fruit. And he said, this tree was planted in 1890. It's 120 feet tall, 12 feet around, right? He goes, this is the only one. You have to help me save it. You know, so yeah, I got it. Kind of like a, a super large daily 11. Yeah, but it, very different as well. Um, so I climbed up in that tree and, and collected budwood and propagated about 
uh, 50 trees that I have three on my property and we spread the other ones around because it's valuable. We need to have breeding material for the future. And people say, well, I mean, somebody at an agritourism meeting today said, oh, the, the, the industry is not interested in anything but Haas fruit. Oh. Well, it's, it's a story as, as in bull um, because marketing is easy on Haas and everybody knows it. And we, we tax the growers and we've developed a market. Now it's being, you know, turned into a commodity by all the production in Mexico, Peru, Ecuador, Colombia. Um, you know, even we get fruit from New Zealand sometimes right. and Australia. Um, and we have to think about how the industry in San Diego County with extraordinary high costs, cost of water, how can it survive to utilize this unique microclimate we have? That's the real key is that microclimate is a gift to us. And if we say, oh, avocados aren't it anymore, well, Mexico will be thrilled. Or if we say, okay, let's look at what things we can do to increase our efficiency, lower our cost, things like high density and keeping the trees smaller. Most avocado growers only prune their trees about once every 12 years, and then they cut them off waist high. And if you prune a tree every year, it makes it much more productive. The other really funny thing we did is we got rid of most of the pollinators. You know, I had, uh, I was sitting at another meeting next to a grower and he says, well, I have 80 acres of avocados. And I said, wow, tell me which fruit do you have? He has, well, I used to have 10 acres of, of Fuerte mixed in to the, the, the state standard. And he goes, but nobody wanted to buy those fruits. So I cut them all out and put more Haas in. And, and I asked, type A and B, both. well, I asked the guy, I said, so did that increase your production? And he goes, you know, I can't figure it out. My production dropped in half. <laughs> For sure. You know, it's like, For sure. oh, my God. And James was telling me, for example, we now have a new um, pollinator called Surprise, which yeah. is a hoss like fruit, but is a bee, you know? So growers can now avoid having to sell a thin skin green fruit. I showed you my daughter earlier. We have um, several Fuerte trees and I picked this beautiful fruit, you know, and I was like, oh, I'm, I'm gonna enjoy this. Brought it inside and she goes, why do you bother to grow that worthless fruit? And I said, you know, you're young. And I waited till it was ripe and we were having lunch one day. And she said, well, it's really hard to open. It's really hard to clean, you know, all that. And I just sat there at the table while we were chatting, cut around it, made it into two halves, took the seed out, cleaned it right out with the spoon, laid it on a plate and sliced it into slices and started eating. And I said, you want to have a taste? Be my guest. You know, and she kind of reluctantly, oh, well, this piece of shit fruit put it in her mouth and was like, oh my God. You know, I was like, well, that's what it's all about. You know, don't tell me you don't like it if you haven't even tried it. I mean, that's when, when I teach agriculture, I have a rule with my students. If we're growing a plant, you have to taste it, but you don't have to eat it. So like sweet corn, just crush one kernel in your mouth to get a little of the flavor. And if you don't like it, spit it out. So I did that once with one of my classes. We were standing in between these two rows in this beautiful shade. And I just pulled a piece off and peeled it and started eating it while I was lecturing. And they're all looking at me like, he's crazy, but this is the this is the 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 craziest. And a young lady was standing close to me and I said, Would you like to try a piece? So I grabbed a piece for her, peeled it back, and she kind of very reluctantly took a bite, you know. And then she just like Great. devoured it. And all the other students, well, we want in, you know, and I went, yes, we got it. <laughs> so we have to try new things as people in our diets. We have to try new things as growers. Look at this amazing organization that's been around in California for many, many, many years. And all the rare fruit growers that I visited across the state have, you know, come out in my garden. I'll show you a few things nobody else has, you know. <laughs> um I, I wanted to show you one of the things. So this is what the first year of the Whittier Coffee Initiative did to raise money. They 
did the honey process of their their beans um and they we have developed a coffee program here so we have geisha this this cupped as a four-year-old tree at 89 which is spectacular costa rica 95 um this is another 95 and uh orchard blend but the real key was um when you have a, a scientific um research project they're always encouraging you to spend the money you know you don't, don't return any money um so what we did is we genetic had every tree in our test plantation genetically mapped and we we got some information about what we really had there based on the historic pool of genetic f fingerprints um it wasn't exactly what we thought we bought but it was good stuff and uh the geishas are one of the most interesting, but I think that there's a few more of those that would be the gold standard in our unique climate with the 12 months on, you know, on bean uh, development. So there's a little bit of a of my uh, work. Yes, sir. Please. Uh, in your rear layer, the plant for propagating and, and tips on germinating seeds. Well, the plant can be grafted, uh, so air layering works. It can also be grown with as a cutting, um, though it's a little tender as a cutting. You you have to you know baby it, nice moisture during the the rooting transition period, um, and uh, it's because it's self fertile. The seeds breed true, so that's another nice factor, and the seed germination is is a trick because it develops a long tap root. Um, they make these black bins that they sell as mortar tubs at Home Depot. So I use mortar tubs. I drill holes in the bottom. So I have about a, a, an eight to 10 inch mass of soil. And we lay them out in rows in there because then we're going to pluck the, prick them out and transplant. Are them. you talking about doing your vegetative uh, propagation? No, uh, seed, seeds right now. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Um, the vegetative propagation is a little different, but cuttings are, right, are pretty. Cuttings. Um, but the seed planting, um, and one of the things is is they really are want a constant moisture during the germination piece. Mm -hmm. So we we cover um, those trays with burlap to help keep the moisture. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a a greenhouse tunnel within my greenhouse and a mist spray system. And are you using bottom heat at all? Yes. Okay. Yes, heating mats under those trays. So the bottom heat is really, really key. It helps. It, it really helps. It stabilizes. Yeah. Well, one of the, the toughest things with really tricky seeds is, is this. You know, you have a nice warm day and then a cold night yeah. and, and you can set them back. So That's having that even moisture at night, I mean, even heat by, at by night. By you maintaining the standard for it. Yeah, it's, 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 the, it's, it's the gold standard for, for that. Did I answer your question? Um, between uh, 21 and, and 45 days, depending. Um, and fresh seed is is better than, than old seed. Seed with parchment or green? Well, the, the key is the trees plant green beans, right? You know, when we have, like I was given the challenge by my client, you know, I want a coffee grove. I'm like, oh, okay, Jesus, how am I going to figure this out? You know, so I started studying what's going on where coffee grows. You know, it's like, okay, okay. And then I did my best to duplicate that. And uh, I've had very good success with that. Um, on the 2300 trees, we also had gopher baskets. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I had... Uh, Eddie Grangetto called me, or Kevin Grangetto called me up one day. He goes, you got to help me with this client. I said, okay, what, what can I do? Well, he planted 600 coffee trees and the gophers have already eaten 350 of them. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I'm listening and I'm going, so did he put root Back baskets? Here. Oh no. He thought that was a waste of money. Uh -uh. <laughs> So he paid $35 each for those trees. He didn't spend five bucks on a root basket and he lost a fortune. You know, it's like, mm. <laughs> we lost one, 
to a gopher. And the, they had set the basket a little too low and the gopher climbed, put its hole up the outside, climbed over, drilled down in, ate the coffee tree, and then left. But out of 2,332 trees, we had less than 2% loss rate. Wonderful. And one of the one of the biggest tricks with transplants that people forget is you don't want to bend them too much, right? Because if you if you collapse the 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 tunnels, yeah. the the capillary network, it'll be what we call a no grow. Yeah. It'll stay alive, but it'll be just this big forever. And you're not going to get your xylem and phloem. You're not going to get it going, you know. So, and then. Um, the protection structures kept most of the animal predation out, though I've had people tell me with, that didn't use the protection, protection structures that the baby plants were really happily eaten by deer. No problem at all, you know, and they get a jag and then they're dancing in your lawn in the middle of the night. Well, you know, those so. protection structures are very, very good. Well, very and it's something that, that I've started using with a lot more material and you all have probably had calls from somebody, you know, how do I save my avocado tree? It seems to be dying. You know, well, send me a picture, you know, and it's like, and I'm like, uh, let's put some protection up and see if we can bring that back and let's feed it and let's do some things. And usually you can even say, save a tree that's pretty, pretty damaged. Um, but people also will do things like transplant a tree in the middle of the summer, right. you know, full size tree. And then they're like, why is it all collapsed over? Well, did you protect it from the sun? You should do that. You know, yes. I mean, think about it. You've, you've haven't been outside. Um, I went with my wife on our honeymoon to Jamaica 38 years ago. And uh, there was another couple from Georgia that was in the next room to us. And we were right on the beach. It was really nice. And the first day we came out, and they were laying out in the sun with baby oil all over them. And I swear, when we walked by, you could smell them sizzling, yeah. right? And it was like, we would go out, you know, okay, get in the sun, get in the water, swim for a few minutes. It's been 15, let's get back in the shade, right? They laid out there for four hours and then spent the next five days of their holiday laying in their beds going, oh, 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 oh. Yeah. oh. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh. And plants are the same way. You know, this little tree, it is in a shade house with 50% shade. If you put it, um, one of my customers bought 10 trees from me, stuck them in the back of his car, parked his car in a parking lot in the sun and left it for four hours. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they got sunburned, literally, you know, nice sunburned leaves. We were able to recover them, but it was like, the next time he bought them, I said, are you going home? Are you going to unload these in a shady spot? You know, yeah. give them a break. They're they're precious babies, right? Don't slap them around. <laughs> what size gopher cages do you use when you transplant from the greenhouse into the ground? Um, well, this is a five gallon, and the five gallon gopher cage will fit a five gallon pot pretty well. And the key is to protect the core center of the tree. the The roots that come out of the cage can be fed on. But if they can feed on the core center, like I, a colleague of mine planted this big avocado grove and said, I'm having problems. You know? So I go out and there's trees like all over that were just stopped and dying. You know, and I went up to one of them and just tapped it. And the gopher had come up right underneath it and eaten it all the way to like just above the soil. So all those trees that he had that were dying had been eaten by a gopher. And they didn't ever had a chance to get established. So I also use a lot of 15 gallon gopher baskets. Um, and I, I make my own when I can't get one for it. Like pecans have a three foot tap root. It's insane, yeah. you know? And so the gopher cages we make are like up to my middle of my chest. And we dig, we have to get a, I had to get a, a front end uh, excavator to make a hole deep enough uh, for the uh, for the pecans you know it's like okay well how are we going to do this you know so we got gopher wire and made these gigantic cages and uh haven't lost a one to gophers so three foot deep how 
wide? Well, those particular ones are almost four feet wide um, because we wanted plenty of room. Uh, pecans are really tricky to transplant. Um, when you get them bare root, the bottom is cut off and it's like that big around, you know, mm -hmm. and then there's three feet of tap root and just a few roots and you have to really baby them. For sure. Uh, to because get them you have established. Too much foliage for the roots to handle. Yeah, well, and that's part of the thing with bare root is also always pruning after we, Correct. either before or after we plant. If I'm doing it for myself, I like to plant them before I prune them because we tend to break a few branches, you know, doing that. And once you've pruned, you don't have much more <laughs> to, to remove. Yes, sir. If you're making a gopher basket, are you using chicken wire or hardware cloth and what size? Well, chicken wire generally has one inch holes and that's too big. Aviary wire has half inch holes and that will stop them. Hardware wire comes in a couple of sizes. The quarter inch by quarter inch is used. It's a lot of wire, a lot of steel in that wire compared to chicken wire. And the chicken wire, the nice thing about it is it, it dissolves into the soil in about five years. And all you find, if you ever have to dig out an old tree, you'll, you'll still see the top of the basket where you, you leave a little bit above the soil. And then about an inch down, it's just disappeared because the the soil biology acids will eat the galvanizing first and then just love the iron yes so the one inch chicken wire is too big is there a smaller chicken wire yes it's yeah. called aviary wire and or gopher wire and uh, you have to search a little bit more around for it um is it probably three quarter of an inch or something half inch half inch okay yeah Three quarters is still a little too big. Okay. Um, like mice, they talk about a mouse can go through a hole the size of a dime. And if you ever see a cat like squeeze through a hole, we have this hole under our fence, you know, and our cats have to like squeeze through it, but they never, it never stops them. Um, so there, there's some, I use the regular chicken wire for the above ground cage because it's more cost effective. Um, but and works great to protect from browsing animals um, and holds the the agricultural fabric that I put around. Yes, sir. Well, I've been working with gophers for a long time, and there have been some wonderful plants like gopher purge. You know, oh, this will stop them. Well, they won't eat the gopher perch, but they'll eat everything else around it, you know. And um, people talk about putting uh, bubble gum in the gopher holes, you know. Uh, well, I tried that, and they were blowing bubbles, you know. Um, and you use cotton. Um, it's one of the things that's interesting as a deterrent. It 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 well it works well, but. Do you drink enough coffee that you can treat your hole, or do you, you I know? Five gallon bucket every day from Seven Eleven. There you go. That's what I was going to say. You cultivate somebody that produces coffee for people. They got to get rid of it, and it's an amazing product. It's an acidifier. One of the things I didn't talk about is the acid soil mix mixes. Um, when I grow coffee, avocados, or citrus in containers, I like to make an acid mix soil because they're acid based. And one of the things I add a lot of is uh, pine shavings. They kind of lighten the mixture, they'll hold moisture, and as they break down, they acidify the soil. I use Tiger 90, which is an organic pelleted sulfur that lasts for about five years to break down. They're little tiny pellets the size of a, of a lentil, um, but they're, they work good. I stuff the holes with the coffee ground and filled it. Great. Yeah, well, it. I mean, it's an animal that's that's there to to do a job, but it's often that job messes with our lives. Yeah. Um, so the one reason we have two cats is they they do some control, and they watch me setting my black hole traps. That's it. And then when I catch one, they're like, "For us, <laughs> no. The ones I catch go to the wild animals. You guys got to catch your own." <laughs> um, any more questions? What about squirrels? 
Oh boy, squirrels are are a challenge. What was the question? He asked, "What about squirrels?" Oh, squirrels, yeah. Squirrels yeah. are a challenge, but actually, someone was telling me today that coffee is good uh, to deter squirrels. Not proper, yeah. I I know. I was like, yeah. well, I got to try that, but I think my squirrels like coffee <laughs> because they they sometimes take my my beans. You know, you'll see a bean that's half eaten. It's like, hmm. Okay, and then the next day it's gone, <laughs> you know, so they're coming back. Um, we have a, a, a mother uh, skunk living under our deck. <laughs> and uh, yeah, you don't want to piss them off. <laughs> and my wife is like, you have to get rid of that. I'm like, hmm, uh, okay. You know, what we'll do is we'll put wire all around the area and leave an opening that opens out and hope that they'll come out that. And then Won't we can close them, in. not allow them back in. Um, and and part of the key with all wild animals is harborage, because rats, for example, love a, a pile of firewood, yeah. you know, and mice. Um, and uh, in in I grow a lot of seedlings, um, and uh, mice love seeds. So my seedling trays are redwood rectangular redwood frames with hardware wire on the bottom and the same for the top. I make them in two by four, two by six and two by eight. So different size plants that I'm growing. I make custom cages for the coffee bins. They have plywood sides at 16 inches, but the wire on top and the bottom because I went to a, a, a colleague of mine's vegetable farm and he was showing me his greenhouse. He says, I just don't know what's happening to my seedlings. And I said, no, oh, there's a mouse in here. Mice. And, and I lifted up the tray and there was a nest and a mother mouse with five babies. Yeah. You know, and I said. Oh, they love those seeds. Just, you know, let me eat what they you're growing for me. Starts. Oh, yeah. So protection systems are, are a big theme in my life from based on experience. Um, but harborage is a very important piece. Um, and providing water. I used to grow vegetables and, you know, you have an extensive watering system on 25 acres of vegetables. And I had a guy full time fixing leaks and I was just breaking my heart, you know, paying him every day and replacing all these parts. And so one day I was walking around the field, I'm going, okay, where are the animals coming in? You know, and if you're, if you start to observe like that little path that grass is, 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 trampled you know and it's like oh okay so i started i get um galvanized buckets metal buckets and i dig a hole that will hold them about three quarters of the way in the ground and i fill them with water at the edges of my field where the the animal tracks are and they'd much rather drink out of the bucket than to go in eat plastic to get to drink of water and it cut my damage by 80 mm percent -hmm. just like that you know, Amazing. and every week I go around and uh, the reason I like the galvanized buckets is the handles really last, you know, so you just pick up the handle and throw it on a plant, put some fresh water in, no mosquitoes, I hate mosquitoes, you know, all the blood sucking insects are not my friends, but they're all around, you know, mm -hmm. so ticks, especially dangerous because yeah. of Lyme disease, but fleas and mosquitoes and, you know, it's like, mm, let's, you guys, let's keep you away. Um, by cleaning up and, and having very little harborage right close to your plants. Because all animals need some place to shelter. So we also use hawk perches and owl boxes uh, because the more predators that are working our space, the, that also reduces. So there you go. Um, I have a neighbor that every night puts out wet cat food for the feral cats. So we have a skunk issue. <laughs> the skunks love the, the cat food as well. Uh, well. Yeah, well, that's mainly what he's feeding. So when mom kicked the babies out, a juvenile moved into my yard. And I have dogs. So what I did was I got I got a bowl and I got a very smelly substance, either bleach or ammonia. You pour it in the bowl in the morning where you think the skunk is sleeping. Oh. They 
will not tolerate the smell. I use bleach that time, uh -huh. but I hear ammonia works too. So I was, and I left it there for several hours. Mm -hmm. And then when I came back, the skunk was gone. And then I fixed the bottom part of the fence. It was broken. Yeah. Well, our skunk, my wife has been reading up. So she goes out and puts all around our deck cinnamon. About twenty dollars worth, um, you know, and and, and then then she read, oh, flower. Okay, so now there's a white line and a brown line, yeah. you know, and footprints going through it, you know, and I'm like, you know, okay, what else, you know? <laughs> so it it the best is to find a way to make them happy someplace else. Sure, that's the very best, yeah. you know. So when we don't provide a lot of they like low shelter. Animals like to come out and feed and go back into shelter. Yeah. So if you don't have much shelter for them right close to the plants that you're concerned with, that can help. And when they're eating your irrigation lines, give them some water because they're they're here, you know. Um, Scott, do you have much problem with ringtails, raccoons? Um, they nail a lot of my fruit. Uh, they love the fruit. They like tomatoes. And the solution that I've had, I had a, uh, I was working in a greenhouse that had open sides, nice top, growing tomatoes. And we had these Fly big, right up and in. big, beautiful fruits. And, and you'd come in that, oh, we'll harvest that tomorrow. And there'd be a big bite out of it. Right. And it'd be like, uh -uh. They, they know the day that you're going to oh. har harvest and they get They're, it right. They, they like them about two days and, and sweet corn. Oh my God, the raccoons like sweet corn. And I'll be going, oh, okay, two more days. It's gone the next morning. Every plant, they pull it down. They, oh, it's just like, oh. So it, we have to be clever about the raccoons. Um, I once treed a raccoon and, and brought my dog. And my dog was like, eh, eh. Well, I'm going to sit over here. You chase that thing yeah. away. Because yeah, they're be vicious, vicious enough. Yeah. You know? Um, and, uh, I think, well, my wife, I didn't see the footprint, but we had those misty rains the last couple of days. And on some of our, there was some black plastic solarizing an area. And she said, there's a Puma print out there. And I'm like, in Vista, we have sure. recently had some it's sightings of Pumas in, in our area in Oceanside. And now. Bobcats. I think it was a bobcat because they're a little more prevalent in our area. The pumas like to be, but you know, food but situation puma changes. Up there too. There's, oh yeah, there's mountain lions all over. Oh yeah, people people uh, think not, but y you know. Uh, so my uh, daughter's boyfriend put up a trail cam. Let's see what we can. What's what's doing this? You know, it's like okay, we'll see what happens. It's fun. Any more? So I have a question. Go, sir. Your contact information from your nursery. I don't know if uh, you showed it. Is it just oh, it's a, uh, you always think of these things after the fact. Um, we're very simple, besides the fact that I have some cards. Um, the our website is edgeofurbanfarm.com. And uh, on there we both talk about our, our nursery work and our growing work um, and my consulting work, uh, especially in the resources section. Uh, there's some videos that I did for the National Center of Appropriate Technology, their ATRA Ag Division on high density avocado and coffee growing. Um, because high density is one of the things that makes sense for our future because space is ever more expensive. Okay, and the water. The web one more time. Okay, so it's a series of words. Edge, like the edge of a forest, of urbanfarm.com. And we're up in Vista. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we've been uh, doing some interesting stuff. We, we, we have our bare root um, deciduous low chill test project um, because I, I want to find the best varieties for our area to recommend to my clients. So we have uh, 16 varieties of peaches, nine nectarines, nine apples, six plums, uh, five cherries, and then an assortment of pluots, apriums, and a few well, of those fun things. What's the area, uh, say, in relation to uh, Gordy Clawson? 
about a mile above Gordy, one street. Okay. So you're a little closer to 76? Close to 76. If Gopher Canyon didn't stop at East Vista right. Way, it would go right through the back of our farm. Oh, okay. So we have so to go... on the opposite side of the street then. Yeah, Clausen's. and over... And, uh... at, no, on the same side of the of Vista Way as Clausen's. Okay. He's directly below me. I can see right down into the okay. nursery. So Gardens an amazing guy. Blackwell. Yep. And you're kind of close to Steve Spangler then as well. And he, Exotica. He, he's further down. Just a tiny bit. Yeah. He's just below Mason, the second second property okay. between Mason and Osborne. Okay. Thank yeah. You. And uh, so bare root is the thing of the future because mo most of our avocado groves have avocados, maybe 75% of the slope, then maybe 15, 10 or 15% of citrus, and then maybe a pomegranate or a fig, but mm -hmm. nothing serious. But these low chill varieties that are now available, mostly Floyd Zager creations, yeah, amazing yeah. stuff. Oh, he was very wonderful. Very, very the high performance. Still keeping oh, yeah. the stuff going. Oh yeah, genetics. Yeah, yeah. And, Dave uh, Wilson was an uh, excellent partner with uh, Floyd Zager. Yep. So they are the exclusive producers of his material, right. and uh, we're a Dave Wilson um, affiliate nursery. Um, wonderful. So we do some bare roots and, but I'm really interested in the future of the industry. Mm -hmm. So we have to promote for people to use these type of materials to increase the income of their property. Makes sense. And at the bottom of slope where you're watering avocados, you hardly have to irrigate because a lot of water runs down the hill subsurface. Mm -hmm. um, so what a pleasure to get to speak to you folks today. We do um, have a few questions in the chat. Oh, someone has a question for our. Yeah, no, I know. I'm just trying to figure out where the chat is here. Uh, I, I had my hand up for quite a while. It's Pat. Um, how many hours of shade are will you get berries from your coffee with? We have a, an extremely tiny property with very little sun left over. And I thought, well, this can go under my avocados or next to them. Could you hear? Yes, I heard you. We were also getting the chat organized here so I could see it on the screen. Um, we find that if it gets some direct sun, it will do a pretty good job of setting cherries. So um, if it's in full hours, full, eight hours. Well, I would say uh, between two and four hours is is pretty sufficient. Um, and the the key is they really like the closeness of other plants, but they do need a little direct sun to ripen the cherries. So let's see, how often do you fertilize your coffee plants? We use a fertigation system to fertilize every two weeks for all of our trees, coffee, avocado, and the, the bare root collection and the few citrus we in, have. In your watering? In our watering. Um, we also feed uh, usually two, at least two times a year um, lately, I've been using products from an organic producer called the True Fertilizer Company, and they Is make that some the foliar spray. Both foliar, um, but they also make a pelleted or a line of pelleted organic products, and and it's I think key to feed a series of different things. So we feed several different liquids through fertigation, things like kelp, um, fish, and and blended mixes. Um, and then we, we've been using the, the true product as our biannual direct feeding or, or quad annual, depending. Do you feed everything in your farm the same fertilizer or do you give different species? Different, different fertilizers for some of the different crops. Um, you know, for example, the acid loving crops, we, we tend to more of acid mixtures um, and the deciduous doesn't really thrive on that. So we, we give them pretty straightforward mixtures. Yeah, um, IPH. <laughs> what coffee variety is best in coastal with clay soil? Um, I would try several because uh, I've had some growers that have had very good luck with with a with ten different types in right on the coast in heavy clay soil. Um, but we recommend uh, adam adamants to that soil to help the plant get established. Um, when we drill a hole in clay soil, we can sometimes glaze the sides of the hole with the auger and the plants can't penetrate the roots. So if you drill the holes, we also recommend kind of busting them up a little bit with the shovel so that there's places for the roots to get in. 
Um, and and for yellowing see. leaves, is it is it acid that it needs? No, but because it's acid based, the yellowing means that that it's stopped taking up nitrogen because of cold weather. So wow. feed them and then wait until, you know, just like two weeks ago, we started to have consistent warm weather and everything is greening up amazingly. But we we fed this batch of trees in October and they stayed green all through the winter. The ones we fed in September, they had used up most of their nitrogen and got more yellow. Mm. Okay. Um, Thank you. Okay, let's see if I got any more questions here. Oh, 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 Lord, this is a... I think that was it. I think it was just those three questions. Oh, okay. Well, thank you for helping. And thank you for joining us on Zoom. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. It was very informative. Thank you. It was a pleasure. What hours, what hours are you the open best thing is to sell talk about your... what you love? What Say hours, that again? What hours are you open to sell your trees? You said you sell trees. Um, we are basically open by appointment. We're very small. And so people call us and we make an appointment to have them out. Thanks. Um, but, or email. Yeah. Well, you know, let's coordinate. Would you be open to a site visit with the company? That's something that I do invite, yes. Because um, education is the primary purpose of, of my work. I, I teach at the university and uh, done high school, uh, did a farm for San Diego County uh, Office of Education out in the San Pasqual Valley on the boarding high Good. school that we have for foster teens. That was really fun. We, we've taught uh, a little grafting to some of the San Pasqual kids. Yep. They did, uh, they set a group down and they uh, came in. We had, I think, 15 students mm -hmm. that came, a little bus. Yep. We did a grafting seminar. Every one of their apples took. Uh, Isn't that nice? Reported back to us. It's especially yeah. nice when they take the first yeah. time. <laughs> yeah. Of course, apples are nice and easy. Easier. Anybody else? Going once. Oh, yes, sir. You find the things that ripen in May and June are kind of like not so great, and that the things that ripen in July and August, like mid fried and much better fruit. Well, my wife has a very simple explanation for that. There's no heat in the spring. So we have we harvested the first fruits, not a Dave Wilson variety, but Florida Prince, uh, or not a Floyd Zager variety. It's an older variety from Florida. And uh, very nice peach taste, but more acid than sweet. You know, the balance was was there. Um I mean, it was the first peach of the year. What What's wrong with eating the first peach of the year that was yeah. wonderfully ripe? But the heat makes a huge difference. It does. Can't get away from that at all. Tomatoes is another example of that. You know, a, a good hot summer tomato. Ooh, that's exotic flavor and smell. Anybody got any more questions tonight? Yes, sir. People say... Uh... Their trees aren't living well, you know, five years and the stone fruit dies or the boars get them. Is it just oh, healthy or what do you think? When you can tell somebody, no, you just do it wrong. For the most part, I go and see a lot of trees like this that are sad. They've been in the ground four or five years. They haven't been getting taken care of. They haven't been getting fed. They haven't been getting pruned. And, you know, what do you expect? It's... It's like growing a lawn. You put $10,000 into putting out sod, but then you never do anything else. It's going to die. Unless you're, you know, in Missouri where it rains every week, maybe, and, and it will take. Um, so we we do have to go a little bit further to, to help. Um, we do a what we call a unified mix for all of our trees. So like we plant coffee, it's got um, Tiger 90 in it for long-term acidification. Uh, we use azomite as a mineral source. Um, I, I particularly love Dr. Earth fertilizers because they're made with complex components from nature rather than yeah. just chicken shit, excuse me. Um, and uh, so Dr. Earth also has some mycorrhiza in it, but I yes. supplement yeah. with uh, mycorrhiza that I get. Mycorrhiza is wonderful. 
Oh, it's it, it's it one of the, the new root nodules to gain all their nutrients. Oh yeah. Well, when you think about it, when one of those uh, propagules germinates uh, into a root, yeah. it then quadruples the mass of the root through the hyphae, exactly. and the hyphae are mineral dissolvers, and they tr they grow into the roots to trade the minerals for um, glucose from photosynthesis. That that's they can... one of the blessings of worm castings when so you're doing your transplants. We 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 also put in our mix uh, worm gold is okay. the, the the most reliable product I can buy in a bag in the worm world, um, and. Uh, we vary that mixture a little bit different for the stone fruit. We we leave out the Tiger 90. We use a regular Dr. Earth. Um, we sometimes now also use the, the true pellets, yeah. um, but they're very strong. And I like a milder start. Uh, so just a little bit of that. Whereas um, worm gold is, is what I call a maintenance feeding. If I have to keep transplants in small containers for an extra couple of months, I'll only feed them with worm gold. So they, they've got plenty of nutrients, but not a force of, you know, huge nitrogen. So they'll get all root bound. Very good. Yeah. And, and then we make those bags up um, on an assembly line. And we do that particularly for a reason, measuring out each one so that we can compare the trees. Uniformity. The uniformity of that is really key. Very good. Yeah. Fun stuff. I've All only right. been doing this 51 years. I'm beginning to figure it out. That's right. <laughs> Thank you. My pleasure. And and good growing to everybody. Thank you very much. Good night. So I have a card here for anybody that would like one. Um, yes. Bring some uh, small berries and some blackberries off my tree if anybody wants Okay, everyone in Zoom, we're going to call it a night. Thank you guys for attending. Enjoy the evening.